You know, Bob once said something really profound. Markets are really hard to invest in. And I thought that was so profound that I, you know, I thought about that for a long time. I'm only joking. It wasn't that profound, Bob. But no, I mean, like, <laughs> no, in all seriousness, I think last week, I mean, if anything teaches you markets are hard to invest in, it's last week, right? We had an attack from Hamas on Israel, a conflict in the Middle East. Uh, we had inflation come in hotter than expected, but markets didn't sell off. Oil prices didn't skyrocket and interest rates didn't go up. So everything you think would happen in a scenario like that didn't happen. It's like markets are always so counterintuitive. And it just blows my mind how anyone can be a day trader because you never know how markets are going to react to any sort of information. The reality is things really aren't that bad. Dad, you and I were talking yesterday. Uh, you were talking to a client of yours, and he was saying that, um, you know, how horrible things are. But you pointed out to him that things have never been better. You know, his, his portfolio is higher than it's ever been. His, the value of his house is higher than it's ever been. He's got to keep things in perspective. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like The news media really keeps talking about all these concerns, which they are their concerns and legitimate concerns. But, you know, let's face it. We're going to have the GDP report come at the end of the month. It's going to be double what it was last quarter. You know, we're going to have possibly, and I'm really anxious to see, you know, based on earnings estimates right now, we might have the best quarter in earnings in the history of the country. <laughs> I mean, and, you, and two weeks ago, the market went down. And you wouldn't even know that, right? I mean, and based on the news you're watching and based on what's going on right now, like it seems like a lot of the really good news is getting swept under the rug. In fact, you know, we just started the earnings season. The banks came in with great earnings, you know, better than expected on the top and bottom line. And we're anticipating earnings are going to beat expectations because we know analysts tend to be a negative bunch, you know? Uh, they tend to see things more pessimistically, and they tend to not have the hurdle high enough when it comes to earnings season. So surprises tend to be in the positive, and I suspect, suspect that's what we're going to see this time around again because we know, you know, people on Wall Street have been kind of dour lately. Not us, but a lot of those analysts have. You know, I think a prerequisite to be a, a pundit or an analyst or somebody in the media is that you have to be able to take great news and spin it so that it's bad. Yeah, so true. So that's, I mean, that's the purpose of our podcast is to you know, report the positive news. I mean, or actually the actual news, right? What's actually going on in the markets. Obviously, we're going to have an optimistic, you know, spin to it because we're eternal optimists and, and, and it pays to be an optimist. I've never met a rich pessimist, by the way. <laughs> but, you know, this is why you tune into us that, to find out what's really going on. And, and, you know, we just kicked off earnings season. Like Ryan, you said the banks came in with good earnings. Pepsi had great earnings last week. Uh, this week is a big week for earnings and next week. So Benjamin Graham's famous quote is in the short term, the market's a voting machine. That's why there's volatility. People invest, buy, and sell on their emotions. But in the long term, it's a weighing machine. And what it's weighing is earnings. So everybody keep an ear out for the earnings that are coming out this week or next week. It's going to determine, you know, which way the market's going. Yeah, and it should be skew the positive because if we look at growth in this quarter, like the U.S. growth for the third quarter that we just went through, based on early estimates, it's going to be red hot, <laughs> like not like a little bit of growth It's going to be huge growth, something like four or five percent. And nobody anticipated that. So if economic activity is way better than expected, and I think it goes back to just kind of one of the simple themes that we've been talking about a lot on this podcast, is just the fact that people have jobs, wages are going up. And overall, even though inflation came in a little hotter last week, it's still moderating. You know, I think that's just kind of the, you know, we call this the Goldilocks economy, but this is that soft landing that the Fed's been talking about. And we're actually getting it and nobody wants to believe it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, I'll tell you the big news was, you know, the, the CPI came in a little hotter than expected, than anticipated, you know, you know, pretty much on the estimate. But when you take out shelter, right, I don't want to get too wonky here, but, you know, big like 30, 40 percent of the CPI number that the Fed uses is based on rent inflation. And rent inflation, according to Zillow and apartments.com, it's coming down. Um, and so the, the the actual inflation rate is close to 2% already if you take out shelter. And shelter is clearly in a downtrend. So, you know, it's a matter of time before that's recognized in a CPI. And if inflation goes down, that means interest rates go down. That means everything else goes up. Yeah, and meanwhile, you know, you've had the, the longer bond, the long bond, the 30-year bond, which no one talked about. I don't think we ever talked about on this podcast, hit 5% recently. And we know mortgage rates have gone up a lot over the course of the last couple months, which has really tightened conditions in the economy, which may convince the Fed not to raise rates anymore. In fact, if you look at the futures market, we're pricing in rate uh, cuts next year. 
So interest rates may actually go down. And this is something we've talked about a lot. This is why you don't want to just sit in cash because that 5% is so sweet. But next year, if they were, if they cut rates, you could be at like 3%, you, you know, so it's, it's really a good time just to, to reevaluate what you're doing. Because the one thing I can promise you guys is things are going to change. Well, you know what, Ryan? I was talking to a friend of mine last night. Uh, he's, he, he and his wife are, are thinking about buying a house over the next 12 months, and uh, he's got a whole bunch of money sitting in cash. And I said, you know, look, if you're not going to buy a house for another 12 months, why don't you lock into a better rate? Well, why would I do that? Interest rates are going to keep going up. They're not going to go down at this point. That's impossible. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, the market's pricing and they will go down. And this goes back to another Bobism is we tend to invest on our most recent experience, right? And our recent experience is inflation's gone up. Uh, market's been extremely volatile. So maybe I'll just sit in cash and wait for things to settle down. And again, as Bob likes to say, this is, this is all about Bobisms today, by the way, <laughs> is markets don't settle down, they settle up. And I think that's what's going to happen here is you're going to miss the boat. Markets could go a lot higher here. Meanwhile, you're sitting in cash and your interest rate goes down. You're like, man, I should have listened to Bob, Chris, and Ryan on that podcast like a year ago. Yeah, it's the CPI index is the Chris Payne index now. <laughs> the Chris Payne index? <laughs> that's right. Well, you know, that's where it comes down to you've got to invest with your brain, you know, not with your heart, right? Because, hey, look, it really feels good right now to put money into the money market under 5% or a three-month treasury at 5%. It feels good. It feels comfortable. Oh, I'm so happy. It's, I'm so, you know, comforted by the fact that my money's going to be there in three months and I don't have to worry about it. Well, what you really should be worried about is inflation. You should be worried about the income you need for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Now's the time to extend duration, right? To lock in those yields so you always have them. You know, short term is short term is short term. All right. Yeah. Repeat after me. Short term is short term. <laughs> it's not investing. It's waiting to invest. Now, if yeah. you're going to succeed in your plan, you have to invest. If you want to wait to invest, well, go to the casino. It's it's more fun. Dad, were you always really successful in life making short term decisions? <laughs> <laughs> Made some really bad ones, Chris, but I'm not going to go into that today. Being short sighted. That last time I checked, being short sighted is not a positive attribute. <laughs> No, it's not. And I think this goes back to just full circle on, on counterintuitive is right now, now, not only is it a great time to buy stocks, but it's a great time to buy bonds. It's the best time ever not to be in cash. And that sounds so counterintuitive, right? Because it sounds so smart to be in cash. But right now, to your point, Bob, like I would be locking into longer term bonds here because we're at a 16 year eye in interest rates. You know, take advantage of that. Lock in for a couple of years. Don't lock in for one year. Um, and, you know, in addition to that, you know, people talk a lot about how the market's so expensive here. Well, it's really not. If you take out those big cap seven stocks, the Magnificent Seven, you start looking at the valuation of the market. It's historically getting to the point where it's actually cheap. You know, one time I was listening to Zig Ziglar and he was talking about how his brother could handle anything except temptation. And I think that's a, uh, a a view on the entire human race. You know, we can we can handle anything except temptation. And, you know, those short term high rates are tempting, but it's just like that fruit on the story of Adam and Eve. You know, it can be poisonous. Yeah, that's a good point, Chris. And I'll tell you what. You know, it's a, <clears throat> when it comes to investing right now, you know, cash flow income is really half the, half the story. And the income you can generate in your portfolio now is the best it's been in 20 years, whether it's dividend income or bond interest. So now you can have that cushion, right? Now's not the time, you know, to sit and hide and suck your thumb. Now's the time to be in fully invested in a diversified portfolio. Dad, you shouldn't describe Ryan's working conditions. Is it weird that Chris is sucking his thumb right now? Is that, uh, is that something we should be concerned about? Hey, we're, we all learn a lot from Liam. You know that, guys. Is that who you want managing your money? <laughs> um, but no, I mean, look, I mean, bottom line is we just look out ahead here. Economic conditions look pretty good, right? And if you start looking at into next year, we should still have growth in the economy next year. That's what the Fed's anticipating. Um, it might be a little slower growth, but slower growth is better than no growth, as we like to say. And meantime, even looking at earnings going into next year, they should be like almost double digits. So, and you got valuations now that are reasonable. It's just a great time to be a long-term investor. And I don't want people to miss the opportunity. You know, Ra, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think the biggest fear and it kind of, uh, you know, you, you have these memories of the worst times, right? The worst times for me is when inflation was hyperinflation, you know, back in the 80s, 70s and 80s. Um, and now, you know, we're afraid of 3.7% inflation. It's down from 9.1. Think about the drop we've had, you know, over the last year. It's proving to be, in my opinion, you know, inflation has proven to be transitory as opposed to, you know, sticky like it was in the 70s. Now, you go back for 10 years, 11 years, right? We had the average inflation rate in this country was nearly 8%. 
You want to talk about hard times? You want to talk about scary times? That was then. That's not now, right? Now we have inflation coming down. Rates are priced to a, to a place to win, right? You have a great income you can lock in for life. And stocks are priced, you know, for a big upside move. Once you see these, these short-term rates peak, based on history, based on every other cycle, four or five cycles, everything goes up huge, except short-term rates. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 137, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach, and you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, Bob, Chris, and I will run for you our total financial master plan. We'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. We go as far as building you, your own personalized financial portal. There's no other firm out there that will do this work up front. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life and just hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. Whether it's an income plan for retirement, how to take Social Security, how to draw from your portfolio, factoring in inflation, your costs are going to double over the next 20 years. You need to factor that into your plan. We'll give you a full dynamic income plan. We're going to look at diversification. Markets have been extremely volatile over the last two years. Has your portfolio been like a yo-yo going up or down? going way up and way down, or have you been sitting in cash, paralysis by analysis, trying to figure out what to do? We'll put together a full investment game plan, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life, and we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high-cost products like annuities, mutual funds, brokerage products, structured products. We'll do a deep dive of every investment you own, show you how to reduce the cost in all your investments, and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's now what you make, it's what you take. You'll get a full tax playbook. If you saved over a million dollars, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's a tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point, having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And Bob and Chris, you know, with the 50 or so financial reviews our firm does a month for existing clients, new clients at Pain Capital, we do a lot of them. We find that it's almost scandalous how badly some financial matters actually get addressed in a lot of your portfolios when it comes to your financial plan. So I'd like to talk about some of the steps you should take to create a scandal-free, I like to call it, financial independence plan. Guys, I have a question. How is the mutual fund industry still in existence? Great marketing. <laughs> what do you mean, Bob? You don't like paying higher fees for more tax inefficient uh, products? I don't get it. It's amazing. I mean, just, just a couple of weeks ago, another article in the Wall Street Journal about how active money managers underperform their index again, you know, year in, year out. Uh, it, it just blows my mind. I guess if it wasn't for the 401k industry, where a lot of people aren't informed because they don't have advice, uh, I doubt mutual funds would exist today. Well, it is kind of wild because now we have the exchange traded fund, which is a much better structure typically costs less. It's completely liquid. You can sell it during the day. And if it's in a regular brokerage or taxable account, it doesn't pay out capital gains at the end of the year like a mutual fund does. And we know how much that can really blow, if I was to say, because at the end of the year, you could have a loss on your mutual fund, but the manager may still have paid out capital gains. So you may still pay taxes, even though you have a loss on the fund. Like why would anyone own a mutual fund in a brokerage account? But we see it all the time. Well, you know, and I want to go back to fees real quick. Uh, I was talking to a prospective client a few months ago, and we were going through their portfolio. And I showed them on the funds that they own versus owning a low cost ETF, it would save them 20 basis points. And they said, well, that doesn't really seem like a lot of money. Well, on a, on a million dollar portfolio, that's $2,000. Yeah. yeah. What's that over 10 years compounded? Exactly. Yeah. Which I love to do, by the way, we'll take all the fees that someone's paying um, and figure out all the income that they're not getting because the fees are eating it alive, that portfolio alive. And you do that over like 20 years. Sometimes it's like a half million dollars, sometimes a million dollars or a couple million dollars, depending on the size of the portfolio, that you don't realize that you're just paying out to all these very benevolent financial institutions that just <laughs> love to take your money uh, and take it from you blindly because you can't see where they're taking the fees. No, it's so true. And, you know, and the other, the other problem that I see um, isn't just the mutual fund industry, it is really the insurance industry. Because, what, you know, obviously insurance products are always expensive, right? That's why insurance companies are so successful. You know, that's a given. But it's not just the annuities that they're selling. When they try to expand outside of insurance, they're always selling non-traded real estate investment trusts where you have the highest fees possible, 
they um, they advertise this income stream, which turns out to be return of your own principal, and it's illiquid, right? So they you know they take really simple investment strategies and they make it complex, they make it expensive, and the only loser is the investor. Well, you know what I like to say about those, Dad. If it's illiquid, it's inappropriate. It's so true, Chris. There's nothing out there that you can't invest in that's liquid and low cost based on what Wall Street or the insurance industry is trying to jam down your throat. Yeah, I mean, it's it's scandalous. I did the uh, topic of this uh, this segment. You know, the other thing I think is scandalous as well is having a financial planner and not having that financial planner talk to your accountant and your estate planner. You really want all three working together you know, I like to call it your financial dream team. And mo it's, it's shocking to me. Sometimes we'll bring in a new client and their accountant has never heard from their tax, prof their financial professional before, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> like, because every decision should be in concert with what you need to be doing in your estate and taxes above all things. You know, it's like we always say, it's not what you make, it's what you take. Well, you know, guys, last week we had, um, and anybody who's listening to this podcast today, you know, should tune into our prior episode. Uh, I got a lot of great feedback you know, with the estate attorney that we had on with the basic tips and, and basic strategies that you should be employing, uh, you know, with your estate plan. I was amazed to find out how many people that uh, aren't clients of ours that, that you know, called in just specifically, you know, to, to talk to our estate planning attorney. Well, you know, Ryan, you and I, you and I went to see a client about two weeks ago uh, just to meet with the estate attorney, you know, just to be there to hear what they had to say, just in case there's anything that we need to change in the portfolio. Well, yeah. I mean, there's so many things that you need to do uh, in concert, especially now with the estate tax credit that's going to change in two years, potentially. So there's a lot of proactive things that need to be done. Uh, but to do any of these things in a vacuum uh, blows my mind. Um, it's about now more than ever, right? I mean, it's just like it, you look at just all the different end of the year strategies we're deploying for our, our clients, whether it's doing Roth conversions while the market's down. It's a great time to do that. Um, you know, you have to be talking to your accountant, you have to be talking to your financial planner together just to see what you can be doing to optimize. It's always the simple things too, right? It's just making those simple tweaks that just have a huge impact long-term. And most of us are thinking too much about, I need this hot money manager or some other, you know, way to make money that's insane, where there's easy ways to structure your portfolio in a way where it benefits you long-term, where you pay less tax, but most of us don't even do it. It's wild. Yeah, you're right, right? It's a simple thing. It's like the uh, required minimum distributions that that we're executing right now for our clients, um, working with their CPA or their tax preparer, and knowing whether they should withhold for state income tax in some of these high-income states like Illinois and New York and New Jersey. Because um, if you don't, you know, you're going to pay a penalty. And, you know, who wants to pay a penalty to the IRS or the state of New Jersey? Yeah, and last time I checked, you can't write those off. The IRS is not a nonprofit. <laughs> the other thing that I find very, very scandalous is when we run these financial projections, a lot of us haven't factored in inflation and healthcare costs. And let's face it, we're living longer, so medical costs in retirement are going to be way more. And inflation is going to double over the next 20 years on average. So whatever you need today, that amount's going to double just to do the same things. So most of us aren't really factoring in a lot of these higher costs uh, that are associated with living longer, healthcare costs, and inflation, and you have to factor them into your plan. You have to throw the kitchen sink at your plan and really figure out what you're going to spend over the long term. You've got to add all these elements into it. That's so true, Ryan. I was talking to one of our insurance brokers this past week, and she was saying that for a male that has to go into some kind of skilled or assisted care, it can cost anywhere from 500000 to a $1 million. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, you know, you got to at least account for a quarter of a million to a half a million dollars coming out over your lifetime just in medical costs. And most of us don't do that when we do our financial planning. But these are the type of variables you have to factor in. Yeah, for my almost 50 years of planning, I found that <clears throat> there's hyperinflation when it comes to education and it comes to health care costs. You know, they, they grow way above the normal inflation rate. And we're in an above normal inflation rate. So you can imagine what's going to happen to tuitions and happen to health care costs, especially since my generation, the baby boomers, we decide to live longer. And we're um, eating up all the resources when it comes to health care. We're putting so much demand on the health care industry that they've got to go out and hire. They've got to wait, raise wages. And health care costs are going to continue to go up because their services are in great demand because – of the boomers. That's why Bob can never retire. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys, I'm retired. I just haven't signed the paperwork. Don't tell anybody. <laughs>
got lost in the mail. Sorry, Bob. Just a couple more years. Uh, you know, the, the other big, I would say, uh, scandal, and Bob, you talk about this all the time, because it's all about Bobisms today, <laughs> is the fact that a lot of us just take way too much risk that we don't need, especially when you're getting to that wealth distribution stage and you're getting close to drawing from your portfolio. You have way too much money at risk. It's like you're investing like you're 30 and now you're 50. Huge mistake. We see it all the time. Well, guys, you know, risk is something that's only truly recognized in hindsight. Um, I, I spoke to a contractor that did some work for me just recently, and he said, you know, I've, I've just been investing in utility stocks and Verizon and AT&T because they have high dividends. But I don't understand why I'm down 40%. Um, and that's, you know, it's just, a, it's, it's just a, an error that you make because you don't, didn't understand the risk of buying a high dividend stock. It sounds good. It looks good. But as you found out with experience, it's not good. So, you know, I think what I have found over my career is 90% of most investors, 90% of every new client we've ever met was taking more risk than necessary. And when I say risk, I'm talking about volatility. You don't have to have that extreme volatility in your portfolio, or do you need to put your principal at risk like this gentleman just did? Yeah, but we're also finding, too, that, that not taking enough risk is a risk, right? You know, <laughs> trying to buy into those short-term instruments that we talked about in the first segment today. <laughs> Yeah, because of that inflation, Chris, right? Inflation's fi finally top of mind. Um, and now folks realize that the biggest risk in their plan is inflation. You got to have that hedge against inflation because, like you said, it's so tempting to put everything in the money market fund. You know, just like in the 80s where we had a 19% money market fund. Why would you invest in the stock market was about to go up 20, 30% a year? Because <laughs> rates came down. So it's a good le lesson to learn. But I think, you know, bottom line, just to wrap up here, is there's just so many little nuances that you really need to review when it comes to your plan. And by addressing some of these more scandalous parts of your financial plan, you can really tweak things to your benefit to put yourself on the right path and really on a solid path to financial independence. All right, it's the hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, for nearly 2,500 dividend-paying companies between 2009 and 2022, dividend hikes for small and micro-cap stocks outpaced large-cap and giant-cap hikes by approximately a factor of two. And this plays out. The yield for the small caps, so the Russell 2000, is 2.9% right now, whereas for the Russell 2000, which is a large-cap index, it's only 0.9%. Uh, small caps are much more cash flow rich, something you definitely want to have in your portfolio. Well, of course, you know, small caps mean small capitalization stocks or small companies. They have a market value under a billion dollars. Um, they're some of the fastest growing companies in the world. And everybody knows Apple, Google, Amazon. If I named the top 10 holdings in a, in a small cap ETF or index, none of you would know the names of them. But if you go back over history in your lifetime, the best performing part of the market is small company value stocks. And here's the shame of it, guys. 90% of the people we meet don't have a penny invested there, nor have they had a penny invested there over that 40 years of outperformance. You can say it all you want, but Chris doesn't care. He just wants to own Tesla, NVIDIA, Apple, and Amazon, and that's all he cares about. <laughs> all right, Chris. In the wake of the oil shock of 1974, the U.S. economy contracted 3%, adjusted for inflation, sending unemployment up to 9%, while inflation topped 12%, what didn't inflate were stock prices. The Dow Jones shed 45% in the brutal bear market of 1973-74. Ouch. This is like when Bob started in the industry. Yeah, <laughs> that was a, a tough time. That was, a, that was an epic time for, the, uh, for, for Wall Street and the financial advisory industry as a whole when Bob uh, stepped his first day at, uh, at Merrill Lynch. But, uh, uh, what, but were, yeah. what were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> it was an incredible buying opportunity, I would say. Bobby, yeah, why did you get in the industry? I mean, it was a horrible time to be a stockbroker, let's face it. Well, let's face it, guys. When you, you got out of college in 75, um, the unemployment rate was 11%. Um, Wall Street had just started. The economy had, had gone through a horrible period. Wall Street went through a 75% decline over a two-year period. Everybody was leaving. I was a contrarian at heart. And, you know, I always go where everybody's leaving. Plus, it was the only place I got offered a job. Hey, you know what? That's all good reasons. Hey, the building um, might have been on fire, but at least it was warm. <laughs> <laughs> well, gentlemen, another great episode. 
Uh, if you like our episodes, you love our podcast, like it, please give us that five star rating on iTunes, put a comment up there, tell everyone how great we are. If this is Spotify, you can subscribe. If you're watching this on YouTube right now, you can like this episode, you can subscribe to our channel, click that notification bell to be updated every week of our new content. Your support gives the ability to continue to do this podcast. As always, stay loose and keep an open mind.